A member of Congress is calling for action after our NBC News investigation aired here last night about artificial turf. The New York City Parks Department and the Los Angeles school system no longer install the surface, citing multiple health concerns. This is the stuff everybody's talking about. Soccer and football players alike are very familiar with them. The black dots called crumb rubber are actually shredded car and truck tires. They contain all the same chemicals found in most tires. The International Agency for Cancer Research labels four carcinogens. We mix together uh, natural rubber, synthetic rubber, and a cocktail of other exotic materials that are then fed into a mixing machine to create the compound. There's a whole mixture of other secret ingredients that go into there. Each one of these hoppers contains uh, an ingredient, but unfortunately we can't tell you what's in there. That's our secret recipe. But this is, these chemicals and, and these ingredients are mixed into the compound, um, which then goes through into the construction of the tire. Any small carbon black particles or dust, while also producing hydrocarbon gases. We're dealing with talcum powder kind of consistency at large volumes. It's not necessarily the soot that you can see that's the problem. The real problem is the tiny things you can't see. Fine particles can contain heavy metals that are very, very toxic. They can contain particles that are radioactive. They can contain heavy metals like arsenic and mercury. Metals in the brain don't mix very well. Uh, they they actually have profound effects on the development of intelligence in children. They affect behavior. They affect the ability of people to have healthy children. Fine particulate matter remains suspended in the air for weeks, for weeks, okay? So fine particulates from the soot you can see is also going to be suspended in the air for weeks. Welcome to the world of the nanometer, a unit of measure that is one billionth of a meter. A nanometer is pretty small. Uh, one of the best analogies that I like to use is to compare it with a human hair. If you take a hair off of the top of your head, you can see that it's very thin. And now if you take something that's 100,000 times thinner than that, that's a nanometer. And what scientists have discovered is that at the nanometer scale, everyday materials start to act in unimaginable ways. The behavior of nanomaterials changes, or can change, when the size becomes so small. When you have things that sort of start changing the way they behave, um, it sort of opens up an entirely new phase space of material. Suddenly, it's like the periodic table projects out into a new dimension. <laughs> it's not just that we have the list of elements, it's where we can change their sizes, and each size is a little bit uh, different than every other when it's very, very small. They're making these engineered nanoparticles and they're using them everywhere, but no one knows about their toxicity and no one knows about the long-term effects in the environment. The nanoparticles end up in the sewer or they end up in the sea. They go in the rivers. And so you've got a vast sink of nanoparticles in the environment. So there's a great need to know the toxicity or the deleterious effects of these nanoparticles. In December 2006, the city of Berkeley amended its hazardous materials law to include nanoparticles, making it the only local government in America to regulate nanotechnology. Well, it turns out that if you take materials and start looking at them when they're sized in the nanometer range, their properties indeed do change. And scientists didn't know this before until we started having the tools to be actually do this. Toxicology has a lot of problems, and uh, nanotoxicology is amplifying these problems. I think that, first of all, the toxicology had enough problems without nano. We know that nanoscale materials can enter inside cells, and we know that that could have consequences for health. And so it's incumbent, it's really required, that we do research to understand what is the nature of the interaction between new engineered artificial nanoscale materials and living systems, not just cells, but whole living beings. According to CDC, one out of every six American children now has some kind of neurological disorders. It's because of chemicals in our society. I'm concerned that there are questions that haven't really been looked at or answered 
but we've got these fields out there. You get it in your mouth and you wouldn't think about it. Jordan Swarthout started playing goalie on turf when she was 12 years old. Some weeks in high school practicing as many as 20 hours on crumb rubber. At age 21, Swarthout was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. The former goalie is on Griffin's list. Names the coach continues to gather of soccer players who have developed different types of cancer. Annika Jibovic, 18 years old. Emma Loney, 15. Austin Everett died at the age of 25 from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I would have them in my ears. I would have them everywhere. In my hair, I would even blow my nose and I would have them in the tissue. Last year, she was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Lolly Walker from Colorado reached out to us about her daughter. Faye played soccer since she was four and was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma at age 16. A former college football player now battling leukemia. I feel sick to my stomach that the artificial turf can have so many chemicals. Biology of cancer uh, varies a lot between different cancers. Our own genetics vary, and both of those have a big impact on it. The doctor came in and he said, you know, in all my years of medical practice, this is, this is the worst x-ray I've ever seen, the worst chest x-ray I've ever seen. Hodgkin's lymphoma, stage four. You end up ingesting the crumb rubber accidentally as a goalkeeper. It's unavoidable. The coach continues to gather of soccer players who have developed different types of cancer. Many of them are blood or lymph-related cancers, but there are others in there, too. Former professional goalie and reality TV star Ethan Zahn, who has twice beaten non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, had been keeping his own list. At four to five times a week, I was on it for hours, sweating, bleeding, everything. And she said, I just think it's something with the field turf. The former Husky goalkeeper was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma during freshman year of college when doctors discovered a large, deadly tumor. It was about the size of a, a little bigger than a softball, and it was right in the center of my chest. The pain is still fresh for June Leahy. Her daughter, Austin Everett, a star goalkeeper for Seattle's Blanchett High School and later the University of Miami, died a year and a half ago. In 2008, we told you about a Tacoma Stadium High goalkeeper's battle with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Back then, Luke Beardimple and his family wondered if crumb rubble had played a part in his cancer. I'll catch it, it'll stop the ball, but not the pellets, and it'll go into my face, it'll go into my eyes and my, my mouth. In 2008, the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission stated that its exposure assessment did not include chemicals or other toxic metals beyond lead. Tires do contain metals and chemicals that had been ruled too toxic to burn in Washington state. The average athletic field uses 27,000 tires. NBC News repeatedly requested an interview, but after several emails and two phone calls, the EPA refused. When we asked the CPC, CPSC for an interview in response to our investigation, the agency declined our request. We have posted much more information on our website, along with a dedicated email address for any of our viewers, tell us your story and comments. Ryan? Our coverage will continue as well. Stephanie Gosk with our investigation. Thank you.